You suck with cinch. Admit it. Go on, admit it. And today, I'm going to tell you why you suck. It does not need retrocognition of the past or divination of the future to know why you're here. You desire change, but you lack the acuity to do so. Never fear, because after today, you will change. The Blake Weaver has demanded it, and Kairos' Immortal Empires campaign will no longer be beyond your comprehension. Now this is a guide as to why you suck with Sinch on campaign, specifically the Immortal Empires campaign. As a disclaimer, this is also not intended as a guide for multiplayer. It would take more than the architect of fate to unravel the mysteries of why you're so bad at that. My name is Blake, and I bid you my fondest welcome to Blake's Takes, where today I'll be giving you my take on why you're just terrible with Cinch. Is my take hot or not? Let me know in the comments below. If you enjoy today's video, please like and subscribe, it really helps the channel out. Now come, let us whisper, you and I. There are webs most tangled for us to weave together. Whether this video helps you or hurts you matters not, for we are nothing more than puppets dancing to Tsinch's tune, and the outcome has already been decided. Reason you suck with Sinch. Number one, you don't know how to use blue fire correctly. The blue fire of Sinch is your bread and butter spell. It is cheap to cast and basically good against everything. And by the late game, you should be getting carpal tunnel from clicking on it so much. Carpal tunnel, carpal tunnel. It's, ah! Oh Jesus, he's got it bad. The reason you can spam it so much is primarily due to the prismatic plurality skill, unique to Sinch, which puts this spell on a two second cooldown, which is frankly absurd. This chaotic blast of eldritch energy will snake and writhe its way towards your enemies, but to ensure you can get the most out of this spell, and the catastrophic damage you can unleash with it, you need to understand its trajectory and how you can fire it for maximum effect. For single entities, lords and heroes, you want to be as close as possible to your target, so that all the bolts can hit true. This spell has great range, but the chaotic slithering of the bolts will cause you to miss smaller units at longer distances. Funnily enough, if you're using this spell on cavalry or infantry, you want to be further away for precisely that reason. The bolts will scatter through the enemy formation, striking many of them. Ideally, you'll be facing the side of the unit where you can rack up some absurd damage as the bolts penetrate multiple entities. So remember, single entities, lords and heroes be flying up above or close to them. Multiple model units hit them from the flank, from a long distance, for massive damage. This is especially useful when units man the walls in sieges, where the units blob together into tightly packed formations. You can see how devastating this spell is. Reason you suck with Sinch. Number two, you don't seduce Slanesh. In the beginning, you start at war with a Nurgle faction to the east of you, and in somewhat amicable relations with a Tsinchian faction to the west. Maintain the peace with the Tsinchian faction and exterminate the Nurgle presence. Your forces are almost a direct counter to Nurgle's slow-moving trash, so you will be able to dispatch them with no difficulty. Then you will happen across forces from this Slaneshi faction here. This faction is very scary early on for Sinch. 
your early game forces are very slow in comparison to theirs, and by the time you reach them, they will be well on their way to having a full stack of fast-moving, hard-hitting demonettes that will chew through your units like... Well, like... Like butter. Yes, like butter. Thank you, Bricktop. This again is where you must be delightfully devilish in your machinations, and hire, you guessed it, another goading lord. This time to seduce the Slaneshi forces out of their fortress to attack you. Kairos will lay an ambush, and the sight of a lonesome lord all by himself will look... Look like curry to a pisshead. Yes, Bricktop, like curry to a pisshead. You know, you have a wonderful turn of phrase. This seduction of their forces is to divide and conquer, fighting both the army and the garrison of the fortress all at once in this early stage of the campaign is not advisable. They are so fast that they will reach your demonic firing lines and tear them to shreds. You need to break them into smaller, more manageable parts, and you will have a far easier time relieving them of their territory. Kairos is not strong enough to carry these battles for you yet, so you have to play tactically. Be seductive. Unfortunately, this faction will do a bit of seduction right back at you, and will steal a few of your units to serve them. There is nothing you can do but hope they take a mortal unit that can shatter and run from the battlefield, rather than one of your demonic units who will disintegrate and die. The ambush stance will serve you very well in this campaign. The lush jungles of Lustria and the Southlands are great hunting grounds, and your quarry will be numerous. Reason you suck with Sinch. Number three, you can't get over the Oxyotl obstacle. Oxyotl will declare war on you. He simply hates you and all the beautiful change you stand for. He will come at you hard and fast, with big dinosaurs and a horde of skinks which, in a fair battle, would absolutely clap the cheeks of your early game units. Luckily, we have no intentions of fighting fairly. Our glorious forces have just finished mopping up the last of the Slaneshi faction. Don't worry, we're going to sprint back to base and check in on our Tsinchian buddies holding the west. Wait a second. They haven't been pestering me for military access in a while now. Something is wrong. No, 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 no! Well, because you left the Flaming Scribe's Tsinchin faction to the west to duke it out with Oxyotl, they have now been destroyed. But Oxyotl's armies are disorganized with his recent conquests, and now Kairos has a good number of levels on him so he can pull his weight on the battlefield. The key to defeating Oxyotl is a plan so infinite in its complexity that Sinch truly would be proud of me. It utilizes how the AI treats sieges as well as how poorly your units match up to Oxyotl in auto-resolve early on. From my testing, Oxyotl will come and besiege the Fate Weaver's crevasse. The AI in its current state will rely on attrition to whittle your garrison forces for walled settlements. For minor settlements that have no walls, they will often immediately make the attack, even if it's a victory for yourself in auto-resolve. It is really quite curious and mercilessly exploitable. Oxyotl easily has enough force as well as dinosaur siege attackers to take this settlement with almost no losses. But he doesn't. He will sit and siege the settlement for multiple turns before making the attack, and this gives you just enough time to prepare. Oxyotl besieging your capital now works in your favour. 
This will give you access to a disposable force which you can hurl at his army to distract him in the battle to come. Now, because your early units are so weak in auto-resolve, he will often only come by himself with his army, thinking that his grossly overtuned skinks and big dinosaurs can take out your empire single-handedly, leaving his other armies back to relax in their freshly conquered territory. His hubris will be his downfall. You can swarm him with your crap stack of blue and pink horrors, supported by your settlement's garrison. This will dramatically even up the odds for you. Now, be advised, Oxyotl has more armies lurking around, which are as big and powerful as this one. There is only so long you should wait, as he will begin bringing more armies into your territory. You really do not want to be fighting two of his armies at once with your early units, so you need to execute this trap quickly before reinforcements arrive. Now we have a plan at the macro level of play. The board is ready, the pieces are set, but how do we execute this at the micro level of play? How do I stop sucking in the battle? I hear you cry. Oxyotl will bring a lot of skinks to the battlefield. An overcast pink flames of Tsinch will basically delete a unit of them. Use the blue fire of Tsinch on the Saurus warriors or any big dinosaurs he might have in his army. Because Oxyotl has both Stork and Snipe, he will probably be the last unit on the battlefield. The AI does not use him properly, so he's actually a very minor threat who will eventually end up fleeing once his army is wiped out. What is a big threat, however, is the Skink Oracle that starts on a Troglodon, which will do inordinate amounts of damage to you if you let it live for very long. It has a poisonous spit attack and also access to a fireball spell, which he will use to harass Kairos, so he should be your priority target for your opening salvos of blue fire. Now, this is a part you will apply to all of your battles moving forward, and it's a bit of a wild one, so please, bear with me. But here goes. Tsinch is a defensive faction. I know, I know, I'm a madman. I'm sure I'll hear about this spicy little take in the comments section. What was marketed to us as a faction of fast-moving hit-and-run units I find is actually far easier and better placed playing more like the dwarves, except you have a flying caster lord instead of artillery. So there's my strategy. Take your flying caster lord and absolutely bomb the trousers off your enemy while your army holds position to clear up the remains. You do have some great hit and run troops like Doom Knights and Lords of Change, but you can only get those at tier 5 so your best bet in the early game is to turtle up and wait for the enemy to come to you, because your so-called hit-and-run troops of screamers and furies will perish like a fart in the wind. Your flamers are too slow to be used in the field against any faction that has cavalry, as they will get caught and pulverised. Most of your army's damage comes from its range capabilities. In Warhammer 3, when you give attack orders for your ranged troops, for some reason they will often shift the whole unit around to awkwardly face the enemy dead on. They'll then realise the enemy has moved from that position and then awkwardly move again. It's really quite annoying. For maximum effectiveness, you want to give your ranged units as few attack orders as possible because it will ruin your formation. Thus, set up a defensive formation and let their armies come to you. The enemy will arrive at your front lines, absolutely decimated from all the spells your lords and heroes have been hurling at them. Your demonic firing lines and chaos warriors should now be able to make short work of their tattered survivors. I like to make a staunch line of horrors with chaos warriors on the flanks, in the early game, Marauders will have to suffice, but do upgrade them to Chaos Warriors as soon as you're able to. The extra armour really helps them hold out for longer. So, in short, 
draw aggro from the enemy with your flying spellcasting lord and annihilate them with spells. Set a strong defensive position and wait for the survivors of your opening barrages to trickle through to where you can unleash yet more unholy fire down on them. Be sure to put enough distance between the enemy and your main army to ensure your spellcaster lord has enough time to rack up as much damage as possible. Oxyotl is indeed a force to be reckoned with and your horrors are simply outclassed by his units in the early game. You need to utilise every advantage at your disposal. Once you've beaten Oxyotl, Kairos will be able to vanguard deploy, which is very useful in further increasing the distance that you can pelt enemy armies with spells before they hit your defensive formation. I'd recommend trying to get this trait on a few lords as it synergizes well with your spellcasting capabilities and defensive style of play. That's right, abandon your posts. Flee, flee for your lives. Reason you suck with Sinch, number four, you level up Kairos wrong. Kairos is one of the most powerful spellcasters in the game. This is due to his unique skill line where he can get access to the passive abilities of nearly all other major laws of magic. Now, to unlock the passive ability permanently, you need to put two points into the corresponding skill slot. The item that you're awarded for one point in these skill slots is simply two spells from that spell book. It is the second point that unlocks the passive. What some people don't realise is that all of these passives will be active at the same time, making Kairos simply absurd. You want to prioritise Law of Life, Death, Beasts and Fire. Life for healing, Fire for the extra damage output, Death and Beasts for the Augmented Winds of Magic generation. Whenever you cast a spell, all of these passives will trigger, giving your entire army healing and more fire damage, which is most units in your army, while also giving you more Winds of Magic, so you can almost infinitely spam your blue fire spell. It makes Kairos an absolute monster, and probably one of the most powerful battle lords in the game. Do not miss these. The other passives aren't anywhere near as impactful, but the four previously mentioned should be considered mandatory. The rest of the passives you can pick up if you want to, but you also need to look at Kairos' blue line abilities, as well as picking up his spells and his other unique line. He has such a bloated toolkit that you really have to spend your skill points wisely. I find that Kairos is such a monster that he can nearly solo whole armies if he has been leveled up correctly. He is probably the only lord that I barely invest any red skill points into, as he does enough damage that he really doesn't need his troops to be performing that well to still get the win. His blue line abilities, as well as his two unique lines, are far more important. The blue line can give him ambush success chance, upkeep reduction, as well as reduction in cooldowns and grimoire costs for the changing of ways. Remember, the law of life, death, beasts and fire is an essential part of your toolkit which will allow you to solo armies, so you need to be sure to pick those up as soon as they become available. I personally keep the Law of Life item on Kairos, as it swaps out Sinch's Firestorm, which is less impactful than the Eye of Sinch, and it gives him access to healing as well. Reason you suck with Sinch, number 5. You don't set up your provinces correctly. You have two chains of main settlement building, one that focuses on infrastructure, and then one that focuses on recruiting units. Depending on the settlement chain you choose for a province, you'll receive a discount on either military or infrastructure buildings. The majority of your settlements should be infrastructure boosting buildings with key strategic locations set up for the art of war. As a faction, you're really quite wealthy as Tsinch, if you know what you're doing, that is. So let me explain how you can make a lot of money from your settlements. Each settlement has access to the Web of Secrets building chain. This chain can be modified in three distinct ways. 
You can upgrade it in the traditional sense of building it to a higher level, but there are two further ways to modify its output. Siege has access to the Stygian Well building chain in your minor settlements, as well as the library building chain in your main settlements. These increase the income of the province by 15% each at max level. Then you can also build resource buildings, which can modify it by a further 15%. But wait, there's more. Did you notice this little part down here where it says if the winds of magic is strong or higher, you can get yet more money? And that's good for you because you have direct control over those very same winds of magic. Your buildings are essentially selling winds of magic, which you control the supply of. Simply ensure your provinces have enough Winds of Magic to activate this bonus, which will then also be multiplied by your other multipliers. Take this province here. It's making over 5,000 a turn, which for a faction that can also make a lot of money through sacking and looting is incredible. The results have been incredible. No one here. Oh, sorry. The results have been incredible. If the winds of magic are tempestuous, then you will receive no added benefit, so it's best to remove a point and try to get another settlement up to strong winds of magic to activate the bonus. So, remember, every settlement should have the web of secrets and a Stygian well to maximize your cash output to allow you to field more armies. In major settlements, build the library for the same reason. Check to make sure that your settlements are at strong winds of magic or higher to maximize your income. For the war settlements, you should also be doing this to maximize your revenue. The only difference being, you'll be building some military buildings in those provinces as well. Make sure that when you're building armies, to be recruiting from the war provinces, as you get a flat discount on all recruitments. Reason you suck with Siege. Number six, you're too attached to your low tier troops. Oh no, my horrors are disintegrating again. I best close the game. On the harder difficulties, you're guaranteed to lose units as Siege in the beginning, especially your trashy horrors, screamers, and furies. They're very fragile, and the barrier does nothing to protect them when they're in combat. It's fine. Dry your eyes, dust yourself off. Blue horrors are cheap and expendable. They can be recruited everywhere. Screamers are terrible and should never be recruited. Furies are the same. Unfortunately, due to Siege's extremely low base replenishment, your forces will become steadily more depleted over time. Likely more so if you're auto-resolving your battles. I recommend fighting most battles manually, even ones you're certain you can win with just your lord to absolutely minimize casualties. Unless you're certain you'll get fully replenished or are in no immediate danger for the next few turns, which is rare in a siege campaign as you have so many enemies on a lot of different fronts with a very wide border to defend. This isn't always the case, however. Ambush battles, for example, I recommend you auto-resolve to wipe out enemy forces, because most of the damage comes from your army comes from either range or your magic attacks. Often your front lines will get crumbled if you play these out, especially when fighting the lizards and their big dinosaurs, which will trample through and escape the ambush, meaning you'll have to fight them again. And then there's sieges. Look, I made a handout to accompany this video. It will explain the infinite complexities of when you should or should not auto-resolve your battles. It is available in the description below, and you can use it in your next Siege campaign. In summary, because of your low replenishment rate coupled with fragile troops, you will certainly lose units in the early game, so just try not to get too annoyed about it. Only auto-resolve when necessary, or ambushing, or when you have sufficient replenishment rate on your lords, which you certainly won't have in the early game. Reason you suck with Siege Number 7. You have no friends. In the campaign, of course. 
In real life, I'm sure you're held in very high regard by your peers. No, I am talking about this campaign. Friends are simply a luxury which are not available to you. Similarly to my beloved homeland, the United Kingdom, you're stuck on an island and all of your close neighbours hate you. I freely admit that in both cases the hate is somewhat warranted. Yes, unfortunately Kairos is basically hated by the entire world and there's not much you can do about it, and after wiping out Oxyotl, which you are forced to do, you'll be left with an enormous wide border to somehow defend. Now, this is actually the hardest part of the campaign. You need to be able to manage your offense and defense of such a large border almost perfectly, and to do this, you're going to have to be clever with your warring. As we've said before, divide and conquer. On this campaign, Teclis came to me demanding money. If I did not pay him his tithe, he would declare war on me. If that happens to you, pay the money. Buy yourself time, because wars will be coming on many fronts. On the Eastern Front, you have Teclis, Krokgar, Tic-Tac-Toe, and Thorek Ironbrow, who will all want a piece of you. If you push far enough north on the Eastern Front, Imrik will find you and join that anti siege task force. On the west, you have Tenenhuan, a random elf colony, Lord Skrulk, and Rakarth. This is a lot of very powerful enemies to be dealing with, so you must play the diplomatic game. What I found in my testing is Skrulk and Rakarth will often smash Tenenhuan and the elves on the western front. Tenenwan and the Elves will often be too busy defending themselves from Skrulk and Rakath to pose any serious threat, but they will still declare war on you, they just hate you that much. You may need to hire a defensive lord with a small, cheap army just to dissuade any would-be aggressors from the west. This means you should suck up to both Skrulk and Rakath and try to be in their good graces to prevent a war on both fronts. They don't particularly like you, but they will be more open to diplomatic treaty- Oh, Skrulk just declared war on me. My disappointment is immeasurable, and my day is ruined. We even had a non-aggression pact. Sneaky, smelly rat. Oh well, no matter, it's fine. As he had a defensive alliance with Rakath, he decided to join the war as well. But because we were diplomatic with them, we prevented them from declaring war on us for just long enough to get a good foothold on the Eastern Front. It gave me just enough time to beat the brakes off of the Eastern lads to stop them from being any significant threat. So now I can send a couple of stacks over to the Western Front to punish Ramsay Bolton and the Smelly Rat for their treachery, which I'm sure Siege would sort of approve of actually. Reason you suck with Siege. Number 8. You don't use the changing of the ways properly. The changing of the ways is very powerful. Your own cheat code library for Siege. You should ensure that you've researched the good ones. Specifically, force war, halt faction, and reveal faction intentions. There is a fair few technologies to research in Siege's labyrinthine technology tree, but do not worry, your first target should be this technology here, the Way of Manipulation. This will give you the Halt Faction ability, which should be spanned on cooldown. Causing your enemies to not be able to do anything for a turn is extremely powerful, and you should remember to use it whenever you run into any trouble. Do you have an army coming over to besiege you? Not a problem, Halt the Faction. Enemy army too cowardly to fight you? Not a problem. Halt the Faction. It's the most powerful tool in your arsenal because of its low cost and low cooldown. Reveal Faction Intentions is another good one, as it shows armies through the fog of war and where they're going. This is extremely useful when you're defending your enormous land border, as it shows where you need to defend next. My recommendation is to also spam this ability on cooldown. As mentioned before, Kairos has abilities in his blue line of skills that further decrease costs and cooldowns of these abilities, so they're definitely worth picking up. 
there are some abilities which are so laughably overpriced that you shouldn't really bother with them. Things like breaking an alliance can be so expensive you can only realistically do it in the super late game. <laughs> Reveal Shroud is actually a bit of a trap and you want to avoid using it. The shroud you reveal will make other factions diplomatically aware of you, and this will inevitably lead to them declaring war on you, because you're really rather unpopular. I avoid using this one until very late in the campaign, because you have enough enemies to be dealing with early on in the game. Then there's some fun ones like Transfer Settlement, which may be a bit on the expensive side, but they're pretty lolzy, so they get a pass. It's free real estate. In short, as long as you're constantly using Holt Faction, you will be able to gain a massive advantage on your enemies. Look for opportunities like enemies out of position, or use it defensively for sieges. Reason you suck with Siege. Number 9. You don't train your lords. As discussed in Reason 3, your lord's job is to pepper the enemy with spells as a single unit artillery piece. They can't do this job, however, if they're a small, plump, pink flesh lump who doesn't have a mount. That's why you need to train them. Your lords are really bad to begin with, apart from Kairos, so you need to be training new ones up constantly to convert them into the overpowered war machines that they will eventually turn into. They begin as an ugly caterpillar, a useless blob of pink horror, but they metamorphose into a beautiful butterfly, a lord of change, a powerful, spell-casting, flying monster. Simply have your training lord follow around a fully grown lord to reinforce battles. This will boost their levels up, and get them to the point where they can stand on their own two feet. There are two technologies which can help you with this, the Architects Chosen on the right hand side of the tech tree, and the Champions of Change on the left. Both are very useful in this endeavour. You should try and utilise the Province Commandment, which increases research rate for basically every province, to try and sprint along the tech tree. I prefer the Herald of Sinch over the Chaos Sorcerer, because they get access to the disc mount far sooner. The disc mount is what you should aim for. When you unlock the burning chariot, it will automatically swap your unit to it. You should immediately swap it back to the disc. The burning chariot is far slower, and is in my opinion a flat downgrade to the disc. You want that speed, so you can practice arcane guerrilla warfare with the enemy. You should never be sending a pink horror into melee unless you're absolutely desperate, and even then I'd say it's a big gamble. And that's the only thing that the Burning Chariot does better than the disc. When my pink horror wants to change into a Lord of Change, I immediately let them. The Lords of Change may be slightly slower than the disc mounted horror, but they make up for it with good melee capabilities, which should not be overlooked. They are obviously no bloodthirster in combat, but they can hold their own. When they've run out of spells to sling, you can sick them on lower tier infantry, archers or siege weapons very comfortably. They can even help out in the front line fight against elite infantry, if properly supported. But do be careful, as they can sometimes flap their way into being surrounded. So my advice is to stick to the softer targets. So, what do I really think of the Siege campaign in Immortal Empires? Well, with Kairos' new start position in the Fate Weaver's crevasse, the campaign is substantially tougher than what it used to be when you were starting on the main continent. After wiping out Oxyotl, you will likely be dragged into a war on multiple fronts that can cripple your progress. You need to play the diplomatic game to prevent this from happening even if it's just buying yourself a few more turns. As Tsinch, you will have the resources to do this. You can offer gifts, or use the changing of ways to distract your enemies. You really do not want to end up in a position where multiple powerful legendary lord factions are all focusing you. What also hampers your progress is the positioning of your main recruitment settlement. 
By default, your largest settlement will invariably be your capital, and tier 5 units are where Siench really shines. However, you now have a body of water to cross to get these powerful units to the mainlands, whereas before you'd have far easier access to them. You can globally recruit, but that is expensive, and it will be four turns of waiting to gain access to the real powerful stuff. Well, that's it. Thank you for sticking around to the end. That's why you suck with Siench on Immortal Empires. Do you agree with my take on why you suck with Siench? Let me know in the comments below. Just a brief watermelon update, that will be dropping soon. It's been keeping me up at night, thinking how I'll film the blasted thing, but thank you all so much for your support. It really does mean the world to me. I've been Blake, delivering my take. Thank you all so much for watching.